Case Customer Creations is sponsored by Bits and Bits. Use the code JBates to save 10% off your next router bit or CNC bit purchase at bitsbits.com. In the last video, I made this workbench for my daughter. It's a white oak top workbench with poplar base through mortise and tenon joinery throughout. And in this video, I'm going to finish up the final details, put some finish on it, and install a vise. First thing that I need to do is flush trim the tenons to the adjacent bases. And to do that, I'm using a small trim router with a quarter inch upcut spiral bit. And I'm installing the largest diameter base plate that I have for this particular router. Then I can set the depth so that when it's resting on top of this piece of plywood, it just barely snags a piece of paper uh, between the bit and the actual material top or the, the workbench top. Then I can use this piece of plywood that has a hole in it, which is, it's actually the insert plate for my lever router lift out of my table saw wing. And this just elevates the router and the router can straddle back and forth and trim away the tenon to a very precise height. Uh, this is super convenient and super handy. I didn't have to make another jig, just a piece of plywood with a hole in the middle of it. There's four of these tenons on the top surface because all four of the legs go all the way through the thickness of the top. And then all four of the rails go through all four of the legs, each side of the rail. So there's eight on bottom, four on top, 12 of these total that need to be uh, trimmed and nice and flush. And this workbench is sized small enough to where you just easily just tip it and roll it so you have a horizontal-ish surface on top. As I'm in the process of rolling this around, it, it makes sense to just go ahead and start sanding the base as I go. And in this case, I'm, I'm not trying to be perfect with this. I'm only using 80 grit. I know the base is going to be painted. I'm not worried at all about swirls or making this perfect. I just want smooth surfaces. With all of the base cleaned up-ish, I can focus my attention back on the top and I need to trim up the perimeter of the top surface. I cut the perimeter of this out on the CNC machine when I did all the joinery and I did that so I was absolutely sure and perfect of the exact width so that the, uh, the, the base joinery aligned with the top. So I, anyway, I've got a bunch of overhang that I'm going to use the track saw to cut off first on each end. Then I can use this, this big flush trim bit in the handheld router. Now this flush trim bit I really, really like because it's got material behind each one of the cutting edges, which prevents a super aggressive bite. It's kind of like a depth stop. It's not going to let you go too crazy at once. It's also like, a, if I'm not mistaken, seven eighths of an inch diameter. So it's a, it's a pretty, pretty big bit. And it handles this overhang with absolutely no problem whatsoever. I did get a little bit of burning here and there. And when you get burning, that means you're either spinning too fast with the router bit or you're just traveling too slow with the router. And in my case, I was just traveling too slow around the corners. Finally, the top can be sanded. And here I want to vent a little bit of frustration. So this is the Festool Rotex. It's not a cheap sander by any means. And when I first got it, it was a little bit of a learning curve to, to sand with it. I've had it for a few years now. To, to sand and, and make sure everything's nice and neat and you know just get the swirls out and for the first little while I've had pretty darn good results with it but as this sander gets older and older it's a swirl machine I have no idea why it's starting to produce more and more swirls the older it gets well that sounds like it's wearing out right well for this price I'm not a production shop I just you know essentially a hobby woodworker who films what I'm doing why is this thing producing more and more and more swirls the older it gets? Now, it's probably there's a variable here, right? There's an idiot donkey who's running this particular machine, but I didn't used to have this problem, and now I do have this problem. So I don't know what the deal is, and if, and if it's just a situ situation where the sander is getting worn out and needs repair, that's pretty darn crappy because it's incredibly expensive, and like I said, I'm not a production shop. I'm not using these day in, day out. So I don't know what the deal is. I've tried so many different tutorials, so many different sequences of route of paper, whether it's Rotex mode, random orbit mode, high suction on the extractor, low suction on the extractor, different types of sandpaper brands themselves. This thing, no matter what, is just a swirl machine now, and it's incredibly frustrating. So I'm only using this to do like rough work. This is a workbench top, so I'm not worried about swirls or anything like that, but Man, talk about not being able to give a thumbs up. I really don't like this particular sander and I'm stuck with it because it's just so darn expensive. 
Going from something expensive to something dirt cheap here, these are my saw horses that I made in 2013. And if you guys want a little bit of a laugh and want to see one of my really old videos, I'll have a link down in the description. You can check out these particular saw horses. I can't recommend them enough. This is the same set that I made in the video. And I've had these, like I said, from 2013 stored outside in the elements half of their life, stored inside the shop half of their life. They're they're a workhorse. They, they, they're a tank. They're such a wonderful and easy design on soft horses. Check it out if you haven't already done so. This workbench is for my daughter and I initially planned on painting it Tuscan Red because I've, I've got a lot of this particular color and I really really like this Tuscan Red. But it occurred to me that hey, this is my daughter's workbench. Maybe she should pick it out. So we took her to the store and I told her, you know, just pick out a color. I've got a project I'm working on and I just can't figure out what color I want to use. So use your use your imagination, pick out your favorite color. And of course, I knew it was going to be a blue because she's she loves blue. And she picked out this sky blue color. And when she picked it out, I was like, yeah, that's I don't think that's going to look good. But again, this is hers, not mine. Turns out that it looks really, really, really good. So uh, I like it and I'm glad that she picked it out. So we started painting the inside and then working our way to the outside. And after the paint was done, uh, I wanted to start working on putting the vise on. This is a six and a half, yes, yeah, six and a half inch Irwin vise, just an inexpensive vise that I found at my local Lowe's. Uh, first step is to separate the front and back jaw so I can use the back jaw by itself clamped to the workbench and properly locate the holes, drill out the holes and insert the screws to get this thing mounted to the workbench. A little detour from that vise really quick. I, I wanted to add a, a note of some kind to this bench. Something personal that my daughter can stumble upon and that she can, I guess, read at a later date and look back on when she's, you know, older and, and can appreciate this a little bit more. Uh, of course, she's five and she can read really, really well. She'll probably read this right now, but I wanted it to be subtle, not necessarily like a, you know, a Sharpie marker on the bottom side of the workbench. Just a, a subtle note that would kind of blend in, uh, but her curious mind, who, you know, seeking out these small little details, she likes to do that. She's going to stumble upon this. I'm not going to tell her about it. Uh, so I used the laser engraver to cut out an acrylic tag, or acrylic note, I guess you could say, and I nailed it to the inside of one of the legs. Like I said, this is one of those things that if you're not looking for it, it's going to blend in. But the instant that she starts to get explorative on this workbench and really start looking around, she's going to find it and she's going to probably read it and, and hopefully it sinks in and it's just a, anyway, it's just a good little message that I wanted to leave for her. I had an extra piece of this white oak that I used for the top that just wasn't long enough to use in the top. So I set it aside knowing that I was going to put a bench vise on it. So this is the material that I'm starting with for the jaws of the vise. I sized the pieces for the front and back jaw to be 12 inches in length. And the remaining material I can use for that little gap in between the rear jaw and the workbench itself. Part of me wanted to just leave this open because it really doesn't matter. Uh, but I, I, I don't know, I, I just think it's gonna look a little bit cleaner if I fill that gap with an additional board. To locate the mounting holes for the wooden rear jaw, the vise needs to be removed from the workbench. And I pushed all these pieces or pushed the jaws to the left because I figured you're gonna get a little bit of benefit by having the jaws extend to one side. That way you can clamp longer vertical pieces. Uh, but left to right, which side? I don't think it really matters. I thought it had better visual continuity by being right in front of the leg, which is on the left side of the vise. So I pushed everything off to the left and my reference point was, I was making sure that they overhang the right side by one inch. So once the, the rear jaw, it has the holes located and drilled for the mounting screws, I can put the thinner piece in there and then just trace the rear cast iron jaw and that needs to be removed. And to do that, I use the bandsaw. I almost forgot about this step and there's two holes that need to be drilled in the front of the rear jaw and that's just access holes so you can screw the cast iron part to the workbench. With the rear jaw screwed into place I can put the the filler piece on the back side and mark and cut the ends so that it's cut to the appropriate length and then just a little bit of glue and some squeeze clamps will let this set up enough so that I can mount it to the workbench. 
Of course, the front jaw is the easiest. Just put it in place and secure it with a couple screws. And then we can think about how I'm gonna flush trim the top of the jaws with the top of the workbench. My first thought was to use the whole router setup the way I did with the tenons, uh, but I decided to not do that because this amount of material turned into dust just sounds unnecessary. So let's just cut it off instead. Well, if you're gonna cut it off, the first saw of choice would be a flush trim saw, handheld flush trim saw, but I didn't wanna scratch up the top of the workbench any. I've already sanded it. So I decided to try one of these oscillating tools. And you know what? This worked way better than I thought it would. A lot faster than I thought it would. And also the, the resulting surface was a lot cleaner and flat than I thought it would. So uh, I've never used a, one of these oscillating tools for a bulk jaw or bulk cut like this. This is something that, this tool is something that I would just use for a little quick cut here and there. Nothing, nothing like this, but yeah, pleasantly surprised. The surface was good and probably better than what I would have achieved with a handheld saw, but it's not perfect. I didn't expect it to be perfect. So a few passes with the sander and we're back down to just beautiful swirls. I don't like rounding over the edges on a workbench. I just think it needs to be as, as big and flat and square as possible, but I also don't want splinters. So I'm just going around the edges with, with some I think it's 150 grit sandpaper just to break the edges and just to stop the little pokey splinters as you uh, run your hand across the edge. Nothing more than that. For a finish on a workbench, it's recommended to not use a film finish of any kind like a polyurethane because the film finish is going to promote uh, the pieces slipping around, right? You want something like an oil-based finish that's not going to have that slippery surface and it's just going to be as close to a wood-on-wood -wood contact or no finish at all. Uh, but for me, in this case, I'm, I'm, my daughter's five. She's not really going to value work holding right now. Uh, who's to say she ever will? Uh, but I'm more valuing protecting the top from paints and, and markers and all kinds of stuff that she's inevitably going to put on this thing. So I went to my finishing supply cabinet to try and find a middle ground. And I found an old bottle of Danish oil that's been in the back of my cabinet for way too long. So might as well just you know, check two boxes at once and use up a finish that probably, probably all things considered is an old bad finish to begin with. After about 20 minutes or so, it's, it's, it's soaked up as much as it's gonna soak up. So you wipe up the extra and then sit back and think, does this look good or do I not like the way that this looks? And in my opinion, I really, really like the way that this looks, which is, it's cool to, to, to have that realization because I was picturing a red workbench base and I thought it would look really, really great, but I'm glad I had that moment of, you know what, this is hers, let her pick out a color. She picked out this blue and I thought to myself, as soon as she picked it out, I was like, I knew it was gonna be blue, but I just can't picture it. I don't think this is gonna look good. You get it done and it's like, Wonderful. It looks pretty darn good. So sometimes you got to take a step back and let someone else's perspective kind of change things for you uh, For you to, to, to actually see something that you otherwise wouldn't see. And I'm, I'm glad she picked out this color I think it looks great. Uh, that's it for this video. If you're interested in the files for this particular project I have a SketchUp file as well as all of the CNC files if you want to cut all the joinery out on a CNC machine You can do that um, feel free to use that information to make as many of these workbenches as you want and sell them for profit. Go ahead. That's wonderful. Uh, that's it for this video. You guys take care. Have a great day and I'll talk to you in the next one.